have such a privilege today to get to hear from Dr. Mark Young. He's bringing the word this morning. It is so exciting. Mark is a member here. He's also the president of Denver Seminary and just has a deep love of Jesus and the mission of God and encouraging us to be on mission with God. So we are so thankful he's here today. Would you join me as we welcome up Mark? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, we didn't even give the invitation. Somebody just got saved. <laughs> That's right. Uh, it's such a joy to be with you. We love this church. We've been a member here for nine years or so. And we crave every Sunday that we're able to come and be a part of this community. And I, and I have to confess, there's, there's a, or we worship the Lord. It's wonderful and powerful. But there's also a deep sense of satisfaction in seeing how... Uh, Brad, <laughs> Billy, Bradley, Bradley, my grandson, Billy and Katie and David serve and lead the church. They're all graduates of Denver Seminary. So this is a way for us to, for the Lord to impress upon us why we do what we do. So thank you for that. I love you guys. And, I, and let me say, it's a little bit of a miracle that I'm standing here. Um, Thursday night, our youngest son and his wife and their nine-month-old came to visit. The nine-month-old got a stomach a virus, started, you know what they do, on the airplane. And then the mom got it that night, and then the dad got it the next day, and then my wife got it the next day. <laughs> so as of Friday night, everyone had it. So uh, behind the scenes, I texted Billy and said, you know, you might want to have a sermon ready for Sunday. <laughs> Not sure. So we began to pray against that virus, and here we be. Yeah, thanks be to God. So we're looking at the book of Nehemiah. Uh, it's kind of hard to study a book like Nehemiah, isn't it? It seems so foreign, so, so distant, so far away. Uh, so, you know, for example, I thought Nissan was a car, and lo and behold, it's a month, <laughs> right? And then how many of you, like, met an Artaxerxes lately? So it's all about places and names and people and behaviors that are quite distant from ours. It seems like a, a whole other world because in many ways that it is. So how is it that we can read God's word describing a place and a time so different from our own, but yet understand that through the Holy Spirit, that word was recorded for you and for me today? How do we make that bridge? How do we see how what God did then makes a difference in our lives today? I think there are a couple of ways that we need to approach a text like this that seems so distant and so, so far culturally. First is we have to understand that place and time. And so I want to thank Billy last week for setting that context of understanding that we're writing about a place... At that time, the Persian Empire, for you and for me, that area, probably Iran, Iraq, that Persian Gulf area, somewhere over in there. We're, writing, we're reading about a time when the people of God are in exile in that place. And so we have to understand why that happened. And that, that takes us back to, well, who are the people of God and why are they where they are? So we go back to when God calls Abraham to be that one through whom he will create a people for himself. He promises to bless them and to make their name great. And then he, be, meaning God, begins to bless them and he protects them and he shapes them and he guides them and he brings them and redeems them up out of Egypt and he places places them in the land and he blesses them with all that they could imagine and under the under King David and King Solomon they become the most powerful impressive nation on the face of the earth and all of the nations know that it's because of their God that's who they are God gives them victory after victory after victory. And, and Solomon, as Solomon reigns in the kingdom, we read that the queen of Sheba comes and she comes to know who Israel's God is. And other leaders come and they see what God has done. And then Israel begins to worship false gods. Sticks and stones, statues and poles and trees and rocks things that cannot speak, things that cannot act. In fact, worthless, the Bible calls them in the Psalms, meaning of no value. They worship them. 
And so now the nations look at God's people. And they don't see God's people worshiping God. And the question is, what is God going to do? So in order to show himself as he truly is, he judges his people. And he causes nations to come and take the land from his people and to take his people and place them in a land that is not their own. A holy God, a righteous God, cannot ignore a lack of holiness and unrighteousness among his people. So to protect the testimony of his name, he judges, but he promises. He promises them that, in fact, he will bring them back from this place of exile and restore them to the land. So we're reading a period of time when the people of God are out of their land. God has promised them that he will restore them to the land. And Nehemiah hears that as some of the Israelites have gone back, the city of Jerusalem and the nation is not thriving. And it breaks his heart. It's not just for the sake of the people. It's for the sake of God's name. That's where we begin to see the parallels. As people living outside of their land, they are foreigners and exiles. And what's amazing, my dear brothers and sisters, is that we too are called foreigners and exiles in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses, verse 11. We're foreigners and exiles. We're living in a land that isn't our home. Think about what I just said. We're living in a land that isn't our home. It isn't our first place of identity. We're living in a land that ought to seem foreign to us in every way. We ought to be people who are out of step in some measure with the world around us because this isn't our home. In fact, the one whom we worship said, my kingdom is not of this world, didn't he? And Paul would come and say, our citizenship is where? In heaven. We're foreigners and exiles. We're living outside of what the place, the way of life that God has promised us. Just like Nehemiah and his people were living in exile. When people live in exile, it seems to me, the first thing they do is they yearn for home. They yearn for that place, for that, that life that God has promised them. And so Nehemiah yearned to go back. But there are a couple of temptations they face. When people live in exile, on the one hand, they might be tempted to separate from the people among whom they live. To step out of and not have relationship with those among whom they live. We've lived outside the United States for a number of years. And I can say to you that there are ghettos that are created by people who don't want to become a part of the local culture. We used to call it the American ghetto, where all the Americans would get together and talk about American things and eat hot dogs and yellow mustard. <laughs> That's not what we're called to be. We're not called to separate from the people among whom we live. One of the ways I describe this is the shun and shout syndrome. We shun the people we're around and we shout condemnation at them because they don't live like redeemed people. Expecting the unredeemed to live like redeemed people. The other temptation we face out of that separation is assimilation. That's what I call melt and mute. That's when you become so much like the people around you, no one knows you're different. So you mute your testimony of the living God. You're not known as someone who is a foreigner in exile because you've become so much a part of those who are around you. That's what the people of God were tempted to be and to do as they lived in exile. And so the question comes up, if the temptation is to separate and to, and to um, shout condemnation or to assimilate and simply become silent, what, what, why are we there? We lose sight of the reason and our identity of who we are and why we are who we are. And here's the big temptation. We give up hope. We lose our faith. 
that God isn't going to do what he's promised to do. Let's go to that first Peter passage, shall we? So turn over to first Peter chapter two, verse 11. And we'll take a look at how we are called foreigners and exiles, just like Nehemiah was an exile. First Peter chapter two. First Peter is conveniently placed before second Peter in the New Testament. Peter writes it this way, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles. There's the phrase. And remember, this is not someone on vacation. This is someone who has gone to another place to create a life and to create life among whom they live. I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. We are truly living outside of the kingdom for which we are created. And we yearn, don't we? Don't you yearn for God to finally establish that kingdom? The way I like to describe it is this, when Christ returns and establishes the kingdom, everything that's wrong in the world will be made right. And everything that's broken in the world will be made whole. And everything that's ugly in the world will be made beautiful. Don't you yearn for that? Don't you yearn for that? And, and surely there's this incredible sense of yearning and longing for us to be reunited with those who've gone before. But what about that yearning and longing for those who experience injustice and brokenness and ugliness in their lives every day to finally experience what God has created for them? That's what we yearn for. That's what we are called to be in some small measure. When you live outside your culture, what comes under attack more than anything else is your sense of identity. Who am I? So we lived in the country of Poland for a number of years. And while we were there, we fully integrated into that particular culture and language. Uh, we, we stepped outside our door and it was all Polish all the time. Went to Polish schools, worshiped, Polish church, church, worshiped in a Polish church. I, we started a seminary for Polish students. Everything we did was in Polish. And our youngest son, excuse me, our oldest son, went to Polish school, went to five grades of Polish school. Our daughter went to three grades of Polish school. And then God brought us back to the United States. It was awful. When we moved into our home in Dallas, Texas, when we came back from Poland to Dallas, it was 107 degrees. That was metaphoric for two years of hell that was about to unfold. <laughs> A year after moving back to the United States, I had the privilege of taking my oldest son back to Poland. We flew into our little city, and back in those days, there was a chain link fence around the tarmac, and we looked through that chain link fence, and his entire school class was standing there outside that chain link fence, right? So we get off the plane, get through customs immigration. They sweep him up, parents, kids. They take him away. I didn't see him for two weeks. <laughs> They just passed him around from house to house. <laughs> he went back to school. This is a child who was out of school for the summer. He wanted to go back to school. He went back to school. All those relationships. All. I had to take a taxi where I was going. <laughs> so we did our thing there for two weeks. We got back together. The whole class came to the airport to say goodbye. We get on the airplane. He's 12 years old at the time, right? Get on the airplane. We're flying back to the capital city. And he looks at me. Like, 12-year-olds don't look at you very often. Very, very serious. And he says to me, Dad, who am I? Am I a Pole? Am I an American? No, son. You're a child of God. That's who we are. That's our identity. The redeemed of the risen Christ. That's our identity before we're an American. That's our identity before we're a citizen of Colorado. That's our identity before we're a Democrat or a Republican. Lord have mercy. That's our identity before we're a Broncos fan. Lord have mercy. <laughs> That's our identity. That's where we start. 
That's whom we live for. The kingdom for which we live is a kingdom not of this world. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is this. Is that the way we're known? As the people of God. Those who interact with us. Those who know Wellspring Church. Are we known first and foremost as children of the risen king? When we live in exile, dear brothers and sisters, we have to resolve to live out our first and truest identity above all other identities and recognize that we are who we are for the same reason that the Israelites were who they are so that we can establish a presence of the testimony of the risen Son of God. That's our identity and mission. Period. Drop the mic. That's it. Our mission is not to win elections. Our mission is to win the souls of men. And so as we live as foreigners and exiles in this place, we are constantly dragged into identities and activities and commitments that are far less than what God has called us to be. And our resolve is to live as God called us to live. So how do we live out this identity? Peter writes in verse 12, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. We're called to live holy and good lives. Lives that bring joy and life and benefit to those around us. We're also called to recognize that we will be accused of doing wrong because we're going to be out of step. By the way, have you ever noticed how the immigrants in the land are blamed first for whatever problems occur in that land? The exiles in the land are always blamed for what's wrong with the land. That's going to happen to us. We're going to be accused of doing wrong, but our lives are to be so good, to be so virtuous. To be so characteristic of who God is that even though they accuse us, accuse us of doing wrong, when God finally appears and they see him, then they will glorify him because of our testimony. Woo, that's a hallelujah right there. Thank you. It's really hard to preach to white people. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> Now let's go back to Nehemiah and see what he has to offer us to live out our lives as foreigners and exiles. Back to Nehemiah chapter 2. What do we see about Nehemiah? First, at the end of chapter 1, he tells us he was the cupbearer. This doesn't mean he was making minimum wage and working for tips. The cupbearer was the most trusted, the closest person to the king. We have a number of stories from the ancient Near East of kings who were assassinated by people in their own court or by their own family. And one of the ways they did that is by poison. So Nehemiah not only chose the wine so that it was appropriate for the king, but he tasted the wine to make sure that it wasn't poison. So when Nehemiah served the wine, the king could drink it with confidence. The king trusted no one more than he trusted his cupbearer. Nehemiah had earned that trust through his talent of understanding what kind of wine the king wanted, what kind of setting the king needed, what kind of honor the king deserved, and living such a good life in the court that the king trusted him in ways that he trusted no one else. And not only that, but the cupbearer was more likely than not the most influential advisor to the king. He was the one that determined who got to see the king. He was the one that made sure the king heard and knew everything he needed to know and to hear. He worked so that the king would thrive and the king rewarded him by being a cupbearer. He lived a good life and he was talented and he was influential. And as we read on in the passage, we read that he was also transparent. Look at what the king says, or Nehemiah says. I had not been sad at the end of verse 1 in the, present, in the king's presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can do, be nothing but sadness of heart. And Nehemiah, Nehemiah says, I was very much afraid. Well, why were you afraid, Nehemiah? Well, it's pretty simple. 
Nehemiah did not belong to a cupbearer's union that was going to protect workers' rights. <laughs> Nehemiah worked at the whim of the king. And if the king did not like Nehemiah's work, or if Nehemiah somehow offended the king, then there really was only two courses of action, the latter being more likely than the first. He would fire Nehemiah and demote him, or he would have him executed. So to come in the king's presence with sadness would be to create an environment that wasn't honoring of the king's power, that everything in the kingdom was exactly what it needed to be. Nehemiah was courageous to be transparent before the king. So Nehemiah says in verse 3, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Notice what he says. He reminds the king who he is. My ancestors. He knows who he is. He's a child of the one true God. A member, a descendant of the line of David or the line of Abraham. The king said to me, what do you want? So then, he, then Nehemiah cries out to God. Then I prayed to the king of heaven. I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with the queen, verse 6, sitting beside him, asked me, how long will your journey take? And when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I love the way Nehemiah balances the relationship between what God can do and what the king can do. So let's just start with what God can do. There is no way that the people of God are going to return to the land, rebuild the city, and become whom God has created them to be unless God intervenes. The vision is for God to act. The restoration of the kingdom is God's act. Only he can do it. And at the same time, Nehemiah realizes that there are earthly powers, earthly structures, earthly people through whom God will work to bring about his purpose. And so he asks the king, do you ever get, you ever get a little, do you ever wonder about that? Are we supposed to like work the systems and work with the people who can have influence and do what we need to do so that they'll help us do what we need to do so that God can do what he needs to do? Doesn't that kind of make God that small? No. Because for some reason, never told in scripture, God tells us he will accomplish his mission through his people like you and me. And we need to be shrewd and we need to work within the systems and the structures, believing that God is the one who will bring it to pass. And he does. And when he goes back to the land, he finds opposition. That's exactly what you and I should expect. So, what does it mean for you and me and Wellspring Church to be foreigners and exiles in this place? First, we have to remember who we are first and foremost. We are the redeemed. The children of the king of the universe the one who will make all things new. Second, we need to yearn. We need to yearn for God to step in back into history in ways that he is going to do and restore all things to what he has created. Third, we need to live holy and good lives so that the testimony of our king is clear to all of those, all of those who know us. Fourth, we need to continue to cry out and know that only if God intervenes will he bring about all that he's promised us. And finally, we need to be shrewd and live in ways that allow us to see God work through all around us. Let's pray, shall we? And so, our Father, I thank you for the privilege of understanding from your word what it means for us to be your people people who yearn for and wait for you to intervene and establish your kingdom and your rule when everything will be right and whole and beautiful. We yearn for that, Heavenly Father. Yea, come quickly. We pray that through your spirit, we would live holy and good lives, that we would cry out to you, and that we would be shrewd as we yearn for you to work in our midst and in our community. We pray it in your son's name. Amen.